Hello, everybody. It's great to see you all here again. Uh, thank you for joining us on this weekly walk. Uh, now, today our walk is called Beat the Heat, which I think is, of course, very appropriate since we're actually dealing uh, with one of the hottest weeks of the summer so far, with temperatures here in Central Park uh, huff, uh, hovering roughly around in the 90s. All right. So again, before we begin, let's go over the Zoom controls real quick. Now, all participants are muted, but of course, you can use the chat feature to say hello and comment. If you'd like to ask a question, you can use the Q&A function, and my colleague Desiree is going to be on the back end uh, answering any questions you folks might have. Now, closed captioning has also been enabled, but you can also turn them off by pressing the live transcript button and then pressing hide subtitles. The images that you'll see today, uh, these were actually taken from a variety of different sources, including the Library of Congress, uh, the New York Public Library, as well as the archives of the Central Park Conservancy. All right, and of course, our mission here at the Central Park Conservancy is to preserve and celebrate Central Park as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well being of all. All right, folks, so let's get right to it. So, summer, of course, is a time when uh, Central Park really comes alive. So explore the park on the hottest days of the year, and you're bound to see uh, people taking part in uh, very popular summertime activities like sunbathing, playing tennis or baseball, or perhaps maybe rowing a boat out in the water. And of course, it makes sense too, since uh, the park is generally a few degrees colder uh, than the, in the rest of Manhattan Island uh, because of something called the urban heat island effect. Now on our walk, we're gonna try to uh, beat this brutal heat and take a look at some of these classic summertime activities uh, in the park today. And of course, along the way, uh, we're also gonna examine uh, the park's history and discuss how New Yorkers in the past cooled down in the days before air conditioning. Okay, so let's get right to it. So we're gonna start off at the south end of the park uh, over at 6th Avenue and Central Park South, also known as 59th Street. And uh, from here, we're gonna go ahead and uh, make our way uh, north, first towards uh, Cobb Cot, um, and then the Children's District, uh, Heckscher Playground, uh, and the Ball Fields. And then we're going to go ahead and make our way uh, north towards a Sheep Meadow, where uh, we're going to end off our tour over at Mineral Springs. Okay, folks. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and actually begin uh, right here at the Central Park uh, Conservancy Information Kiosk on 6th Avenue and 59th Street. Now, as many of you who spend uh, some time here in the park know, these are, of course, going to be staffed by our very wonderful volunteers who do a really fantastic job of helping us out in our everyday park operations. Uh, believe it or not, these kiosks, they're actually uh, rooted in the park's history. So way back in the 19th century, um, these kiosks around the park uh, they were mostly used by uh, security personnel, and they would actually be stationed at some of the main entrance, uh, main entryways, such as uh, 6th Avenue. Uh, there's also another one over at the 72nd Street as well. Um, these were basically built by the Conservancy not too long ago, and we basically use historical photographs, such as this one, uh, for reference. Okay, so moving on, and we're going to head uh, right up this slight hill. Now, right on top of this hill, you're going to see something called Cobb Cut. It's basically a wooden summer house that provides quite a bit of rest and shade away from the sun. Now, just like the kiosk that we saw uh, earlier, Cobb Cut is basically a reproduction, and it was basically built uh, in 1985 by the Central Park Conservancy. Uh, really, it was designed to look like one of the original rustic wood structures that uh, kind of dotted the park in its early years, which uh, actually used to be a uh, uh, dozens of them uh, here in the park. And that would include things like uh, rustic benches, uh, fences, and of course, cots in summer houses, such as Cop Cot. So this is what the inside of Cop Cot looks like. So as you folks can see, it's definitely a lot more spacious than it looks from the outside. It really is a wonderful spot to just uh, get away from the sun. So of course, note all the uh, shade right here. When I was walking around and uh, taking these uh, images, um, yeah, this really was, uh, very much a uh, nice, relaxing, very peaceful, and uh, very cool spot in the park as well. Um, over uh, time, uh, there would have been something like about uh, 100 of these uh, wooden structures uh, around the park. Um, as I mentioned, they would include uh, things like benches, 
uh, bridges, uh, fencing, and of course, summer houses as well. Now, most of these structures were actually created uh, by a uh, Hungarian carpenter by the name of Anton Gerstner, who was basically hired by Olmsted and Fox in the early years. Now, just in the last uh, few decades, we really have been working uh, quite hard to rebuild some of them. So one of the more notable aspects about Top Cut is that it's, of course, going to be very, very rusty. It's basically uh, constructed out of wood taken from branches and uh, trunks of trees that can be found uh, all around the park, uh, usually black locust trees, which, of course, can actually grow uh, very aggressive. And oftentimes, when we do build these huts and pergolas, they're going to be paired with wisteria and other types of vines to really complete that natural look. Now, I'm always amazed at all the uh, works of art that our crews can create using materials taken from uh, right here in the park. It really is kind of fascinating. Now, just outside of the cut, you can find this nice, lovely uh, bench with a beautiful view of the city off towards the south. Perfect, I think, for, of course, taking advantage of the breeze on a warm summer day. Now, as we descend uh, the hill from Cop Cut, we now come to these uh, ornamentals that definitely give off the uh, hot summer vibes. Uh, these are actually yucca plants. And believe it or not, these are uh, actually native to the eastern half of the United States, uh, albeit found in mostly sandy environments, like grasslands, uh, dunes, and uh, other desert-like conditions. Uh, you, might even have, uh, her, uh, you might even have them uh, in your yard as a perennial plant. Now, these are actually quite rare in the uh, park, but when they do show up, like here in the southern end, I think they really steal a show, especially when their flowers are out in full bloom. Uh, in the early summer. All right, so let's continue heading deeper into the park now. And from Cop Cut, we're gonna head north towards uh, the next stop on our walk. So we're gonna make our way through, right through these pathways. Now, usually this area would be packed full of park visitors, but I think because of the uh, mid day heat, I think most folks were content to stay indoors with the air conditioning uh, this afternoon. Now, right around the corner uh, from the pathway, we can see uh, this lovely building. This, of course, is the, uh, the dairy, one of our favorite historic structures in this part of Central Park. Uh, it was basically constructed in the 1870s, and it was initially used as a cafe where you could uh, cool down with some nice old beverages. At first, it really was a uh, pretty family-friendly place, and you could pretty much buy a glass of milk and perhaps maybe some snacks for your child here. But later on, uh, by the mid-1870s, you'd also start getting things like wine and beer to cool you off. These days, of course, we use the dairy uh, as one of our Central Park Conservancy Visitor Center uh, and gift shops. So please do come say hello to our staff if you're ever around the area. Now, right across the road from the dairy, we can find this rocky outcrop. And right on top, you can find this uh, uh, wood structure called a pergola, which provides some shade for folks uh, during the warm summer days. Uh, these days, the pergola pretty much uh, marks the location of something called the Chess and Checkers House. You can see a little bit of it right here in the image, uh, just behind the uh, wooden structure. And of course, it's also a nice spot to just kind of cool off for a bit, especially when a breeze blows around. But this is also at one point the site of another uh, wooden summer house that was built back in the 19th century. Now, just like the one that we saw earlier in uh, or near 59th Street, this one is actually pretty spacious and it utilized uh, primarily unmilled rough cut lumber to really give it that uh, rustic look. This is also the largest of the park's wood structures. Now, unfortunately, it was then torn down just a few decades uh, after it was built, uh, really because it started to rot out. Okay, and we are moving on. And from here, we're gonna walk right underneath uh, Playmates Arch and continue through the park landscape. Uh, now, this part of Central Park is, uh, of course, uh, called the Children's District. And it was basically established uh, in the 1860s and 1870s, really as a way to uh, provide uh, some amenities for the younger visitors uh, into Central Park. Now, of course, uh, right along the uh, pathway, we can see this uh, drinking uh, fountain. We can, of course, fill up our water bottles here at one of the many fountains uh, throughout the park. Of course, we also want to remember to hydrate often on this very hot day. Now, heat stress can really creep up on you on this weather, and it, of course, can be deadly. So if you have to be outside at all, especially on this hot day where it's like 95 degrees out, 
and you really start to feel like you're overheating or something like that, uh, remember to stop what you're doing, find shade, and drink plenty of water. It really is some serious stuff out there, folks. Now, that goes not just for us humans, but also for our uh, furry four-legged friends as well. Now, many of the park's fountains, as uh, some of you have noticed, actually have these uh, drinking basins just for dogs, and they really can be truly uh, a lifesaver uh, in the summertime. All right, everybody. So uh, right now, I think would be a great time to conduct our first poll of the day. And uh, right now, I kind of wanted to ask folks, what is your favorite way of staying cool uh, in the summertime? Um, of course, every person uh, has uh, their own unique way of uh, you know like doing things. Um, and I like to uh, kind of manage the heat. Uh, by kind of either sitting on a bench uh, and reading a nice little book or perhaps maybe uh, passing uh, the time under the shade. It really depends on how hot uh, it is out there, uh, I think. All right, so it looks like uh, uh, most of us are still uh, voting on the poll. So I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, so let's go ahead and end off our uh, poll right now and we can go ahead and share the results. All right, so it kind of looks like uh, most of you uh, kind of prefer uh, doing things like uh, sitting on a bench or swimming, or of course you can also, uh, just like myself, uh, also just grab uh, you know, a whole tub of ice cream and just kind of take into that. Definitely the perfect uh, summer uh, activity uh, for some of us out there, including myself. All right, folks, um, let's go ahead and uh, continue on with our uh, tour. Um, and from here, uh, you can see, of course, the next stop. Um, this, of course, is going to be a Hexer ball field. This is one of several very popular spots to play softball or baseball in Central Park today. Now, I don't know about you folks, but whenever I think of summer, I always think of baseball. Uh, growing up in the New York metropolitan area, sports like baseball and stickball they really were just something that we did when the weather got hot. Um, these days, you can find something like about six uh, of these fields uh, here in the Hector. Um, and because uh, so many folks are always looking to use these uh, ball fields up, the Parks Department implemented a system for reserving a field. So you can actually go to their website uh, for more details. So just check out the chat for more uh, information. You can, of course, uh, check out the link uh, to the New York City uh, Parks Department website. Uh, where you'll find more information about that. Now, before it was officially turned into a baseball field back in the 1920s, uh, the site of the Hatcher ball fields in the early days of the park was basically just a large open meadow. Now, it was still called a playground, but it really didn't have any play equipment like swings or slides or uh, sports fields or anything like that. Rather, it was more like uh, an open space where kids could run around and roam it. By the 20th century, with so many young people playing baseball here, the city then decided to finally add official fields to the park. And of course, baseball has been a central park tradition uh, ever since. Uh, you can actually see in the image uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, actually a few folks uh, actually playing this uh, new game of baseball uh, in the uh, early 20th century. Alrighty, and so we're gonna go ahead and move on. So from here, we're gonna keep walking west towards the main drive and then make our way uh, north uh, towards the next several stops. Now, just a bit past the ball fields, we now come to uh, one of the most famous cafes in New York City. This of course is Tavern on the Green, and it's basically been feeding hungry park goers um, since the 1930s. Today, you can actually just grab lunch or perhaps maybe a bite to eat and perch yourself on one of the outdoor tables while enjoying the sights and sounds of Central Park. Or if it's a super hot day out like today, you can also just get a nice iced coffee or iced tea or some other cold refreshing uh, drink to go and spend a few hours on one of these uh, tables. Now, if we actually take a close look at one of the uh, awnings on the building, you'll see that the Tavern on the Greens logo actually includes these two sheep. And that's because it's a reference to when the building at one point would have housed about 200 sheep during the late 1800s. Now, the sheep were brought over to the park 
in the 1860s, and they would basically roam nearby sheep meadow all day, uh, herded by a group of full-time shepherds hired by the city. Now, here's an, uh, an image of the sheep meadow from back then, and you can really see like just how pastoral and bucolic uh, the early park must have been with all its carefully chosen details and extra touches. Uh, the sheep were evicted out of Central Park by 1934, and the meadow was then opened up to the, uh, you know, to the public, to everyday park visitors. These days, the sheep, uh, the sheep meadow no longer has any uh, sheep or any animals uh, like that, but you'll still find uh, plenty of folks uh, out on the grass doing things like sunbathing or picnicking. So on especially nice days like the spring or perhaps maybe even the summer, Sheep Meadow can get really, really packed. It really is quite a sight since the lawn is pretty large and can pretty much hold thousands of people. But New Yorkers, I think, are generally unfazed at being part of such large crowds. This one's probably one of my favorite photos of the meadow since it really looks like a scene straight out of a Where's Waldo book. Of course, with so many people using the meadow, especially during the warmer months, Maintaining a healthy lawn is key to having a good park. So every once in a while, we actually close off sheep meadow, and that's so the grass can rest and properly rehabilitate itself so it can be nice and green all year round. It also, of course, gives us some time to uh, do uh, everyday uh, maintenance, which is mowing the grass. Now, before the Central Park Conservancy was established, this lawn was basically unmaintained, and it was known throughout the town as the uh, Great Dust Bowl. Apparently, whenever a gust of wind blew right through here, it also would have carried quite a bit of the dry, uh, sandy dust with it. Thankfully, since the 1980s, uh, the Central Park Conservancy has been working hard to keep all 15 acres of it looking nice and perfect. Okay, so uh, from Sheep Meadow, let's go ahead and continue right on up the pathway. We're basically following the western side of Sheep Meadow and actually see uh, the fencing of the meadow off on our right. Of course, on our left, you can see uh, West Drive. So we're gonna check out the last two stops on the tour. Um, and of course, not too far away. They're back just right around the corner uh, from the meadow. Now, perched uh, on a flat raised area surrounded by fencing, you're gonna find uh, this very, very green area. Um, now, most folks walking through the park don't, they don't really give it much of a thought since these really aren't, uh, you know, uh, these greens, uh, which where you can actually play bowling and uh, croquet, they're really not as popular to play uh, as they once had been in the past. But the small patch of green is actually home to one of the oldest summer sports uh, still being played in Central Park. Now that sport is actually called lawn bowling and it's been around in some form or another uh, for thousands of years. It was uh, played in both ancient Egypt and Greece, and by the Middle Ages, it became a very popular pastime uh, in many places in England. Uh, New Yorkers then carried on this tradition from the very beginning of the city's history. In fact, Bowling Green in Lower Manhattan actually started off as a literal green for citizens to play bowling. The current lawn here in Central Park is going to be created back in 1926, and today it's actually still used by the uh, New York Bowling Club. Okay, so from the bowling uh, greens, let's go ahead and take this pathway right here. And we're gonna make our way towards the east, towards the next and final stop on our walk. Now this, of course, this is called uh, Mineral Springs, which is a uh, home to uh, one of our concessionaires. Uh, these days it's a cafe called uh, Le Pan Quotidien. Uh, and it's a pretty nice spot to uh, grab an ice cold uh, drink after getting some sun time out at nearby Sheep Meadow. Uh, the current structure that we're looking at was added to the park back in the 1950s um, during the administration of Parks Commissioner Robert Moses, who, of course, uh, changed much of the character of Central Park at that point in time. Uh, the current structure would have replaced an earlier building that was designed by uh, Calvert Fox and Jacob Ray Mould back in 1862. Now, the original Mineral Springs was built uh, in the Venetian Moorish style. And like so many of Vox and Mold's works, the building featured lots of grand Victorian details like uh, an ornately designed uh, roof. And of course, you can also see uh, plenty of bright uh, colors as well. Now, as you all can see at the bottom of the image, uh, the site was initially called the Spa at Central Park. Uh, the spa it wasn't really like how we might envision a spa today where you can get a massage or something like that. 
but instead it was more like a pavilion that sold all types of healthy spring waters. Uh, mineral springs was part of an overall trend uh, during the Victorian era to, uh, you know, that kind of pushed the idea that, uh, you know, mineral uh, water sourced from natural springs was just as good as medicine. So at its height in the 19th century, uh, this particular pavilion actually sold dozens of different types of uh, supposedly healthy spring waters from all over the world, such as the Alps in France uh, and in Switzerland, uh, and of course, even here in Saratoga uh, in New York State as well. Now, the interior of the building uh, really was designed to impress, and so it would have featured marble floors, uh, marble paneling, and of course, you can also see this uh, very grand and very, very ornate uh, marble counter uh, right at the center. It also would have had silver faucets that would dispense of these high quality and very expensive waters. All right, folks, so now we've reached the end of our walk and we'll go ahead and leave you here at the lawn right next to Mineral Springs with this nice, cool, refreshing sprinkler. Um, it definitely takes, uh, of course, quite a lot of hard work to, and effort to maintain Central Park. And even during the hottest days of the summer, you're gonna see our crews constantly out there toiling away in the hot sun, maintaining and preserving New York City's backyard for all to use. All right, folks, so that does it. Now, don't forget to check out some of our upcoming tours as well. Uh, we do have a tour of the Hell Nature Sanctuary at the south end of the park this Friday at 11 a.m. Uh, we also have another one at uh, on Saturday, August 13th. So uh, definitely check the link uh, in the chat uh, for the link to sign up uh, for that particular program. And of course, you can also follow us on all of our social media channels like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, you can also uh, check us out on YouTube. Uh, you can use the handle at Central Park NYC. And again, folks, thank you so much for visiting us. Now I'm gonna re uh, leave the room open for any last final questions, but otherwise from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, stay safe and be well. Have a good day, folks.